My name is Tim. I'm a partner manager at Definity, and I'm the initiator of the ICP Lab Business Boosters. Those are workshops focusing more on, on business topics than just technical aspects. And today we actually launching this program with the tokenomic session, which we will start in a few minutes. And I just want to give a quick outlook what's coming in the next weeks. So we'll have a session every week on Thursday during March, where we have next week, we have the marketing and PR in Web3 at the same time. And then there will be community building with um, success stories from founders that built communities on the IC blockchain. And the last one will be a VC panel where they discuss entrepreneurship for Web3 builders and developers. So for now, I hand over to Stephanie, who is the moderator for today's sessions. And um, wish so. yes. and, uh, first, we... Hi, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our event. Uh, we are very pleased to see um, all of you here today with us. Uh, my name is Stephanie Dreyer. I am with Quantum Economics, and I will be um, your moderator today. Um, so our workshop is called Tokenomics, Everything You Never Knew You Needed to Know. And it is not by coincidence that we called it that. So tokenomics is what can make or break your project. And speakers, our speakers today, they will um, try to really drive this point home. So in fact, a well-crafted tokenomics design is what is going to make your project successful and profitable. It is the driving force behind determining the value of your token. Tokenomics ensures that a reliable economic structure and a sustainable community grow. So without further ado, um, let me introduce our speakers. So today we have with us um, Dustin Becker, a tokenomics consultant with Quantum Economics. Um, Dustin will walk us through the basics of tokenomics. Uh, we will have uh, Luyao Zhang, um, the founding president of Sci Econ and the senior research scientist with Duke Kongshan University. Uh, Luyao will talk about how to build your own DAO. Uh, we will have Bjorn Asman, a senior research scientist with the Definity Foundation. And Bjorn is going to talk about SNS, next generation DAOs on the internet computer. And last but not least, we have a special guest, Hamish Peebles. He's going to um, tell us about his um, about Open Chat. He's a founding member of um, the Open Chat team, and he'll present a real life case study. So in the end, we're going to have a Q&A session after all of the presentations, um, but please feel free to write your questions in the chat uh, whenever you think of them, so you don't forget in the end. Uh, but just please make sure that you're chatting with everybody and not just with the presenters. Um, it is a setting that you can uh, adjust in your chat. Um, otherwise, we will just not be able to see your questions. Um, so yeah, this is very important. Uh, please do that. So let's jump right in. Um, Dustin, um, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks a lot for this uh, introduction, Stephanie. Um, so I'm going to give you an introduction to tokenomics basic. And uh, before I go into this, I'm uh, quickly going to introduce myself and us. So uh, we are Quantum Economics, which is um, a research department within Boxler Consulting. And we specialized in uh, tokenomics research and tokenomics consulting. And <clears throat> I'm, I'm Dustin Becker, and I'm one of the uh, consultants uh, and researchers uh, in our department um, and also specializing in modeling and uh, simulation. So um, the goal of this workshop is really for me to bring uh, yeah, you closer to um, tokenomics, for you to really understand what are tokenomics and especially also what are tokenomics not, um, to really uh, get a feeling for this. And um, then to not stay also all the time only on the dry theory, I uh, also gonna go in a small case study in an example that we had um, together with one of our clients, Mod Club, um, to give you a more real world um, example than actually of how such a tokenomics uh, design process can work. And the goal in the end is really for you as a project, as a developer or wherever you are in your um, stage of, the, uh, of your um, application or project, that you really learn how to set yourself apart from other projects 
and um, learn how to really make make a difference and uh, um, yeah in, in, increase the success of your project in the end. So uh, first, what is tokenomics? And it's basically a combination of two words. It's a token and economics. And it's basically the study around this new field of economics that came up with cryptocurrencies and tokens and really trying to understand how, how does this whole ecosystem work and how do the economics and incentives behind this ecosystem work. And now what I did uh, as preparation for this webinar here, uh, what every other good researcher nowadays does is I asked uh, ChatGPT for their definition of um, tokenomics and actually, the, the definition is really uh, quite good. So um, in the end, tokenomics is really um, this, um, the, um, the study around the ecosystem for your cryptocurrencies and digital assets and studying all these factors such as supply, demand, and um, distribution. And these are really the key elements because especially the demand um, with all these different uh, cryptocurrency projects out there, you really have to find a way to thrive the demand for your project for your token and create incentives for people to um, take part in your project and uh, want to buy your token so this is really a key element and um, you do this of course by incentivizing users to behave in certain ways um, and um, incentivizing them to really interact and engage with your ecosystem um, so but also it's very important to understand what tokenomics are not, um, not just understanding what they are, but also what they're not. So a key yeah, part or something that we see a lot of times when you like look through the white papers of projects or um, talk to, um, to projects, um, tokenomics is not simply allocating like funds to all the different stakeholders in your, um, in your project. So not just making a pie chart and saying, okay, 20% is for investors, 20% is for the team. 20% is for the ICO. Now it's really a lot more. So this is one part. It's a token allocation that you need to do at some part during your tokenomics process. Um, but it's not, not all. And tokenomics is also not a rescue boat for a poorly designed product. So you really need to have a good product, a good project already. Um, and then you add the tokens on top of this. And this will like improve your whole project, but it will not rescue you if you have a bad um, product from the begin with. And then also very important, it's not a get rich quick scheme, um, which I think I don't have to elaborate uh, much further. So we really, we are all here, at least I hope to make a sustainable future and um, build really successful and sustainable um, projects. So the elements for your tokenomics design that I mentioned already before. Um, one of them is uh, supply. So this is basically the source of your token. And this can be a fixed source. So you have a constant supply of your tokens or a variable um, flexible source. So you can have like an inflationary or a deflationary um, token um, economics. And the, there are different factors, of course, influencing this. So for example, if you have a governance system, um, and you issue staking rewards, you have these uh, influencing your um, supply. You can have vesting schedules. So from all the investors that invested in your uh, project, they get their tokens at different times. So these, of course, also influence, influence your supply. And then you can have other emissions, like for example, airdrops um, or others that influence also your, your supply. And then the key part, of course, as I mentioned before, is really understanding and designing your demand for your token, um, which are basically the sync of, um, of your tokens. And you do this by creating different incentive mechanisms for, for your token. So one key part really is um, the token utility. And uh, token utility is like, for example, if you, if you take the ICP token and um, you think about what you can do with it. So the ICP token itself is really this key element that you need to interact with the IC ecosystem. So if you want to deploy canisters, um, you have to buy tokens, convert them into cycles, and then use the cycles to um, create your canisters. So you really have this utility for the token to uh, uh, that, that you're actually able to interact with the whole IC ecosystem. But you can also have governance where you then actively participate in the 
um, in the governance of your ecosystem. And um, also you can create demand for investors to simply speculate on, on the token um, and then burning, like for example, in the ICP, when you um, convert them into cycles, the ICP are effectively burned. And then the, the third element is um, of course the distribution. So um, this is where you have an influence in the beginning of your project. So you can uh, define all the different stakeholders that you have um, and define how, um, how the tokens are distributed between those. And I mean, now you see this is, it's a quite a, um, you have very many variables in this, um, in this whole design process. And of course, many things can uh, also go wrong. It's uh, can be overwhelming. And you also see because of this, a lot of projects uh, who have like um, some sort of inconsistent narrative. So you, you have a project, you wanna, um, you have a cool idea with your um, product itself, and then uh, you wanna issue a token, but you don't really think of um, what is the whole purpose of this token? What is um, the, um, the idea behind it? And you need to really make sure that you um, think of this um, in, a, in a very detailed way and you really understand your design and also don't overcomplicate it. Uh, because this makes it harder than for you to really understand. And it's um, prone also for attacks um, as we've seen with some projects. And the key to this is really not only to um, do a general qualitative design of your tokens, but also to do a quantitative testing and analysis of your tokens. And uh, there are different approaches for this. You can do um, top-down macroeconomical modeling um, where you have a lot of um, assumptions that are a basis of this. But what we actually at um, yeah, Quantum Economics um, have specialized on is uh, a bottom-up approach, which is um, the agent-based modeling. And this really allows you to um, take a lot of factors into account and uh, really model all the different parties in the ecosystem together. And with this, actually, I would like to go into the case study because it's much easier to understand if you see an example instead of me just talking about the, um, the, the theoretical parts. So for this, we prepared one of the um, yeah, projects that we worked together with, Mod Club. And most of you or many of you who know the IC ecosystem, you're probably aware of Mod Club and what they do, but they are a content moderation uh, platform. So basically anybody or all the... Um, as a social media platform, for example, like District, they could um, use Mod Club as a, as a service to have their content moderated. So Mod Club um, would basically, or the ecosystem that they create, um, would moderate that the, the posts on District, um, they're ethically okay, I'm correct, there's no child porn and all these kind of things. Um, and that's the purpose of, um, or one of the purposes of Mod Club. And they want to issue a mod token to incentivize um, yeah, the participation of users in, in their ecosystem. And they uh, contacted us and asked us to like, support them in the design process of the reputation system, but also possibly identify different use cases and incentive mechanisms for them for their token, and ultimately also optimize the parameters that they have for their whole token ecosystem. So the moderation rewards and also uh, some burning factors that they have, um, so different parameters that really play a role in your, um, in your, in the in the tokenomics ecosystem of them. And now, when we started with them, we of course first tried to fully understand their whole ecosystem, and then came up together with them um, with such a token flow um, overview uh, of how how does the token flow in their in their ecosystem. And what are the um, um, different participants, the different um, sinks, the sources, like the, the supply and demand of the token and the distribution. And you see here, of course, in the center, you have the Mod Club um, platform where you have the customer applications, like again, for example, district who want to have their content moderated by Mod Club and they pay for this in Mod. Uh, so in their token, and then you have these different um, participants like moderators or any other mod token holders who, um, like it can be any user who buys mod tokens on the on exchanges. Um, you have then of course the governance system where people can um, stake and uh, their tokens and receive rewards. So you have all these different actors 
um, in this in this ecosystem, and you have it nicely presented here in such a token flow. And this helps a lot already. So this is very highly recommended, of course, for any project um, designing their tokens to fully understand what our um, purposes, what are the different um, uh, you like uh, utilities and governance uh, and participants in in my ecosystem with my my token. And uh, you get a very good qualitative understanding of your token ecosystem like this. But now you also want to really understand the dynamics behind your system. So to see, um, get also a quantitative feeling of, uh, of, your, um, of, your, of the token. And uh, for this, this agent-based modeling is a really, really good tool. And the example here is, um, it looks like this. So you see all these different agents in, in this ecosystem. And these agents are basically any, any user, any human or participant in, in the platform uh, or in the ecosystem. And they can be traders who are simply trading the tokens on the market, but they can also be any user of the platform. So moderators or customers, it can then also be stakers who are staking their tokens in governance. And all these different agents, they, they follow their own rules in a way, their own goals. So uh, traders, they want to, of course, maximize the profit by trading, and um, they react differently to um, the environment in a sense of um, what is the market condition? Do we, are we in a bear market? Are we in a bull market? Uh, what is the price of the token? And um, they react differently. And for example, moderators, they react based on the amount of rewards that they're getting. And you can really define the rule sets for all these agents and um, define how they react on different market conditions and uh, yeah, general ecosystem conditions and uh, do a very nice bottom-up quantitative ana analysis like this. And then one example, what you can analyze, uh, what we did together with Mod Club here is the, um, um, like the evolve of the um, mod price um, over four years here, 48 months. And of course, I mean, this is, we don't do any predictions on a price. So this is just um, to get, of course, a feeling of how do certain parameters influence the price? Are they beneficial? Are they um, um, not beneficial for the price? And um, it really helps you to get a feeling. And here we um, looked at the amount of uh, mod tokens that are burned by the ecosystem, uh, the different fractions, and uh, then also studied, of course, uh, how does this affect the price and how uh, do they uh, compare within each other? So you see, it's really it's a super powerful tool to understand how how do different factors in your um, ecosystem really influence different parameters? Because you can also study, of course, other parameters. You don't have to look at the price. And with this, I come to the end of the uh, Mod Club case study. So together with them, we first of all did uh, like a qualitative analysis of. Uh, of the token ecosystem, how what are the different actors, participants in the ecosystem, um, and uh, things and sources, and then we really we applied the agent-based modeling to get a, a verification of our assumptions to really um, fully understand the dynamics of of the ecosystem, and we uh, gained some very powerful insights, and uh, it was it was very interesting to work together with Mod Club on this. And if you want to read more about it, actually, there is a Medium article, which you can also scan in the, in the QR code where um, you have more information about this or just on our Medium Quanticon. And if you want to, want to dive into this um, project that we did with them. And with this, I now come to the end of my part of um, tokenomics. And I want to highlight the takeaways of um, the tokenomics basics. So. The key is really that you need to identify the key elements of, of your project so, or if you token, um, tokenomics of your project. So the supply, demand, and distribution. And uh, where, again, in my point of view, the demand is really, it's very crucial um, because you need to um, distinguish yourself from other projects. You need to set yourself apart um, to gain interest in, in your project because, um, yeah, there are so many out there. And then also every project is unique. So there is no one head fits them all recipe. You need to really look at your project individually 
and not just copy paste from any other project. You need to really try to analyze it um, individually um, and fully understand it. And uh, it's also very important at every stage of your project. So if you're in the beginning, in the middle or at the end, there's always a good time to um, look at your tokenomics and maybe also revise it. And we at Quanticon, of course, we um, are really, we're experts in, uh, in this field and uh, we apply this uh, quantitative modeling as well. So we really um, have made yeah, great experience with this and we are open, of course, to um, uh, work together with you. So if you're interested, you can reach out to us also at, uh, at our Twitter or on the website. Um, we'd be happy to work uh, together with you. And with this, I'm finished. And again, all if you have any questions, I don't know if you posted it in the chat already, uh, but you can post them there and then we'll do a, the consolidated Q&A at the end of the, um, of the session. Great. Thank you very much for this, Dustin. Um, so now I would like to ask Luya to present. Uh, please share your slides. Okay. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, today I'm very excited to share with everyone how to build your own DAO. Uh, so here uh, is uh, the content. We will first talk about the background. So what is DAO? What is DAO for? And the characteristics of DAO. Then we will be talking about um, the mechanism designs of DAO. So that is what are the challenges faced in DAO creation. Uh, finally, I will show uh, everyone a case study that's also our developer ground project at Definity for, for the on-chain governance um, um, neural network system. Cool. Uh, so first, uh, what is DAO? Um, actually, uh, even no matter in academia or in industry, this is n there is no consensus on the definition of DAO yet. Um, I have collected uh, several uh, literatures, and from the literature, it says DAOs are autonomous organizations governed by a set of predefined rules programmed as a source code. So once implemented, such smart contract can automatically execute tasks and facilitate decentralized decision, like hiring new members, providing services, coordinating with other DAOs, and so on. Um, so basically, I, I think uh, what I want to highlight here is it seems from the literature, uh, DAO different from other um, organization because it, it's governed by a set of predefined rules programmed as source code, not by human. Um, and it's predefined, like not coordinated later um, as a human process. Uh, here is another paper. It says we define a DAO as an organization that enables individuals with common goals to code labor with using a blockchain infrastructure to enforce a set of shared rules. So it seems like it also highlights um, DAO is based on blockchain infrastructure, um, so it could be decentralized and without a central entity. And what is DAO for? Um, so for the literature, uh, it says um, the DAO aim to be open plan force through which individual control their identities and their personal data. So this is very different from existing structure. So for the existing organization structure, any of you are either in a corporation, private firm, or a non-for-profit organization or government. So um, as the employee, uh, you ne not necessarily hold your own identity and your own personal data, let alone the other stakeholders like the users. Um, so DAO is very different, like everyone joined the ecosystem and they uh, have the, all their own controls over their identity and their own data. Uh, also, uh, so here is um, the Lewis, the co-founder of Aragon DAO Plan 4. So he says DAO is an internet native entity with no central management, which is regulated by a set of uh, um, uh, automatically enforced rules on a public blockchain, and whose goal is to take a life of its own um, and its own incentives people to achieve a shared common mission. So uh, it seems like it, again um here is 
um, for everyone um, to to autonomously um, like achieve their common goal uh, on this blockchain infrastructure, which is public with no third party. Um, so so that's kind of like the uh, the same uh, answers uh, in the academic paper. So what are the characteristics of DAO? Uh, in general, DAO has, is, is different in many aspects, but um, it, it in general has three uh, features. One is decentralization, so without a need for any central authority. Second is uh, um, autonomy, so it's smart contracts instead of human third party will facilitate governance and coordination. So finally, it's also organized and ordered. So it's an orderly management depending on predefined rules written into smart contracts. So it's like uh, for the smart contract that's early written, we cannot overwrite it later. We can um, update the rule through um, a predefined uh, governance structure. Everyone propose, vote, and enact. But that has also needs to be predefined. Like we cannot invent something out of nowhere that go against the earlier defined rule. Uh, so now let's go to uh, the des uh, designs of DAO. So if everyone now, like you want to design a DAO, what are the challenges given the mission of DAO? Uh, first uh, is a security problem because DAO is based on the smart contract. So uh, any uh, attacks on the smart contract uh, would cause a security problem. A very famous example is a venture DAO hack of Ethereum uh, that um, almost loses uh, 150 million US dollar. Um, and because um, like people did not, um, um, uh, was not able to collect the votes fast enough and it end up with a hard fork which um, makes Ethereum into Ethereum Classic and the current Ethereum. The second problem is decentralization. So because DAO's goal is really to, to do the governance um, like by the people, for the people, and of the people, um, not by a central entity. So we want to guarantee it's really decentralized. However, right now, um, like from existing literature, we find um, um, actually the governance of DAO in Bitcoin and Ethereum are quite decentralized uh, uh, and controlled by the core developers. And for the updates, the governance of DAO, a lot of commits are just from one or two people. And finally, it's efficiency um, uh, for this part, like how you can encourage everyone to uh, contribute their decentralized uh, decision into the ecosystem so it could be um, beneficial for themselves and uh, for collective decision and for short term and for long term prosperity. For that, we really need token economics like what Dustin uh, just mentioned. Oh, sorry. Okay. So same situation. Okay. Can can everyone still see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not anymore. So, now it's gone. There you go. Oh, cool. So now let's see a case study. So it's kind of like a, a example of um, successful design uh, of the DAO. It's the Internet Computer Protocol's uh, neural network system. Uh, so first, uh, it has a tokenized on-chain governance. Like everyone who holds this ICP token, you will be able to participate in uh, submitting new proposal um, and voting um, process. So for this process, it um, provides economic incentives for participation and collaboration. And second, it has a staking mechanism. So for everyone, your voting power depends on how um, much ICP you staked in the system and how long you stake in the system. Uh, because uh, in, in terms of how much money you put into the system and how long you staked, right? So you need to care about the system's long-term prosperity. Otherwise, you cannot withdraw uh, the money um, before you reach uh, the period 
that you must uh, commit to. And finally, it's liquid uh, democracy. Uh, so uh, in, in terms of democracy, there are two failures. One failure is it is decentralized, but no one is expert to making decisions on certain matters. So in this case, um, liquid democracy allows you to delegate your choice to who you trust uh, is going to make the wise decision. And another part is um, it's not inclusive and only a few people are making the decision. So here, liquid democracy also allows everyone to make their own decision in, 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 in either individual or delegation. Uh, so here you can see uh, it's um, the graph we make, a uh, word cloud from the proposals submitted uh, to the NNS system. Uh, and here uh, is uh, NNS uh, virtualization. Uh, so on the left hand side are the voter IDs, on the right hand side are the proposers that the voter uh, votes for. Uh, so we um, have kind of like videos uh, on the GitHub as well. Um, Okay, and uh, that's it. So um, I guess uh, right now we will uh, go to our next speaker who will be talking about NNS, who is um, the version of uh, uh, SNS, who is the version of NNS, not uh, for the uh, native blockchain, but for the decentralized applications on the internet computer. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you so much, Liao. That was fantastic. Very thought-provoking analysis. Um, so Bjorn, um... Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Just give me a second to share my screen. All right, I hope you can see that well. Yeah, so um, I want to talk, as, as Luya just said, right? Like I want to talk about um, the SNS, um, which stands for Service Nervous System, and um, it's a next generation DAO framework uh, on the internet computer. Yeah, so the, um, maybe to start with like to answer the most obvious question, right? Like, so why would you launch uh, a DAO on the internet computer? Like what, what are the benefits, right? If you choose that platform. And um, I have like listed the three main ones here. The first one, it's easy, right? Like we have a plug and play framework uh, where um, uh, you can you can launch, launch such a DAO. Uh, and um, if you're familiar with the uh, network nervous system, which is the DAO that runs the internet computer, right? You can think about as the SNS as like a, um, a, a, a similar framework, but uh, much more configurable, right? Sort of, it, you can sort of change the parameters that have been set for the NNS and adjusted and tailor made it to uh, your use case. Uh, one further key element um, of the um, SNS framework is that it comes with a fundraising uh, functionality. Uh, so uh, there is um, uh, what we call like a decentralization sale. So that's the moment when you launch a DAO. At that moment, people can start participate by um, contributing ICP, the token of the internet computer, and uh, sort of investing that into the, uh, into the, the project. And then uh, if the um, sort of launch is successful, we'll get in return tokens of the um, of the DAO, of the SNS DAO. And they are, there's a dedicated launch pad uh, of which we see like a screenshot here in the middle of the page um, uh, available that sort of facilitates participation of, 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 of users. And there are also different routes available, right? So we have like the, what we call the direct participation where uh, people can directly use their ICP tokens to participate in such a launch. Uh, and we also have uh, the concept of a so-called community fund, which uh, collects um, funds over time and then uh, invests in these upcoming projects. Uh, and hence, like if you are a member of the community fund, you benefit from an automated participation process in such uh, uh, DAO pro uh, projects. And the third reason I've listed here is governance and tokenization. Um, as you just heard, right, DAO stands for decentralized autonomous organizations. So it's crucial to have a functioning governance framework. Uh, and so every SNS comes with a dedicated governance token uh, and is the setup is highly configurable. And um, the, the underlying token that is then created at the launch can then be traded straight away on DEXs. 
Okay, cool. So let me move on. Uh, and yeah, just show you a little picture so that you get a feeling on how like the governance of uh, uh, of, a, of, of an SNS works. So um, yeah, if you start on the left hand side of you as a user, right, uh, let's assume you acquired some tokens, for example, because you participated in the decentralization sale, then uh, you have the ability to um, lock up these neurons in something in a container that is called a neuron. And uh, while locking up uh, like these tokens, you acquire the right to participate in the governance of the DAO. Uh, and that means uh, you can, on the one hand, submit proposals for changes, right? for example, change the code of the DAO. Uh, and, um, and you can also vote on proposals that are submitted by other people. And, uh, and then you are receiving rewards in return for your participation in the governance. Like these rewards then are the sort of the incentive generated to participate. And the amount of voting power, so the amount of say that you have in the decision-making is in a function of how many tokens you have staked in such a neuron, for how much time, and for how, long, how much time the neuron has been around already. Okay, now um, let me talk a bit about the, the, the way like how an SNS is born, so to speak. Um, and I think, you know, you see some elements of, of, of concepts that were discussed in the previous two talks. So it starts, the first phase on the left-hand side is the setup phase. So that's um, where you think about the tokenomics of a DAO where you um, should think, for example, about the token distribution. Um, so you see a little picture here on the left-hand side, like this little pie chart, right? Which has um, I, like three main groups. So X is the group that the amount of tokens that um, the DAO plans to sell in the decentralization sale. Then Y is the amount of tokens that the DAO will keep for itself in the treasury. And Z is the amount of tokens that is meant to go to a developer team or potentially earlier seed funders. And so in this uh, phase, like the all like the thinking about the tokenomics and like the, the modeling as Dustin explained earlier happens. So like that's really like uh, key to to um, do that in this phase here. And also of course then syndicate the ideas, explain why certain sort of setup was chosen and engage with potential participants um, already at that, at that moment. So let's say all of that work, which is a lot of work, is done, right? So we have finalized the SNS setup phase. Then we move to the middle phase, and that's now uh, decentralization sale. So uh, here is um, that's the moment when people can use the launch pad that I mentioned before to participate and help with the funding of the DAO of the SNS. And it's actually um, uh, you can. Think about it in a very simple picture, right? You can imagine it's like a warehouse where on the one hand side, you have amount of tokens that you want to uh, sell in that sale. So um, let's say 10 million tokens, for example. And on the right hand side, you start collecting um, uh, ICP tokens that users are chipping in. And then at the end of the sale, uh, like these two amounts uh, will be exchanged so like the the amount of in a way like the um, predefined amount of tokens of the fns which is available on the left hand side of the warehouse compared to the amount of icp that was collected on the right hand side of the warehouse that determines the exchange rate that um, happens uh, that will be, be applied for the exchange and and there are of course a couple of parameters that uh, can be entered as part of the sort of uh, sale configuration. For example, you can specify a minimum uh, funding target and a maximum funding target. You can also specify a sale duration, et cetera, so that you have a certain amount of control um, over the process, but on the same time also allow price discovery during the decentralization sale. And now um, once that decentralization sale is over, uh, you really then start the living of the DAO starts. And so like then this third phase is called here decentralized operations. That's the moment where people, participants receive their 
FNS DAO tokens, uh, some of them locked up in neurons, which I explained before, so that they can a, be then are able to participate in the governance, submit proposals, and vote on proposals. Yeah, and I think we, I mean, we have like, uh, like later, Hamish will talk a bit about the open chat DAO. Um, and just to give you an example here, so um, that, that DAO was launched last Friday uh, and collected, um, like the maximum funding target was a 1 million ICP, uh, which corresponds to roughly uh, $5 million, uh, a, bit, uh, um, a bit more than compared to uh, current exchange rates. Uh, and um, that, that amount was uh, actually reached very quickly within eight hours. So like the sale started last Friday and even finished also last Friday. So it was a big success. Okay, so so we talked a bit about the governance. We talked a bit about the um, fundraising part and the path to digitalization. So um, I want to, uh, before I conclude, I want to show you a little picture, which uh, I create, created this week, which I quite like. So um, I think one, one key element um, for for me for DAO is also that participants in the DAO actually have have access to a lot of data so that they can audit and, and verify what's going on with the DAO. Uh, and that's something that the SNS framework facilitates. So you can query uh, data about the sale itself, about the governance setup. You can query who has how much voting power and so on. And so what this picture now depicts here is um, uh, the set of all neurons in the open chat DAO as of Monday this week, where sort of one node in this graph is a neuron. The size of a, of a, of a, of a node is the amount of voting power uh, underpinning that neuron. And um, uh, a connection, an edge between two nodes mean that a neuron is following in another neuron. So that links to the, the concept of a liquid democracy that Lu Yao just mentioned before. So you can delegate voting to other neurons in case that you uh, trust somebody sufficiently enough uh, and you don't have the time to vote yourself all the time, you can delegate that and creating the concept of liquid democracy. Yeah, and so I think it's, I mean, it's super, super exciting. And you have like these data are available for everybody. Everybody can pull that and do some analysis. And of course, that, that's a brand new DAO. So like I'm expecting to a lot of changes and, uh, uh, and, and development that we can sort of monitor using, for example, this kind of visualization. Okay, so I think the um, I have just two more slides left. One thing which I want to quickly manage is that um, I'm uh, the the SNX, SNS framework comes with a lot of uh, configuration possibilities, uh, and um, in order to support the process of uh, uh, choosing these parameters, um, uh, we have created a, a toolbox where I can do certain assessments which are relevant uh, for for the DAO framework. For example, um, if you enter a certain um, uh, configuration of your governance system and a certain token distribution, you can assess the distribution of voting power um, at launch, for example, uh, to verify that the DAO is indeed decentralized, as it says in the name. Um, you can also, um, there are other elements that you can assess, for example, sale dynamics. You can determine like what kind of, which, which what are the range of the price discovery that you allow if you choose certain dynamics like it's in a way like it's a it's a playground that you can use to get familiar with the uh, key parameters that are available to you uh, and what they would mean and what kind of effect they have yeah and that brings me to my last slide so uh, like please reach out and learn more about the sns you want to if you want to launch DAO. Uh, so i think a good starting point is the sns web page of course which i've listed here we also have more in-depth developer documentation which talks more about the technical aspects um, of a DAO launch and we also have a wiki page which contains some like training material and also like the tool that I just showed uh, for tokenomics so that you uh, can get familiar with the uh, token uh, configuration. All right so I think that was everything from my side then uh, thank you for your attention and back to you Stephanie. Thank you so much, Bjorn. Uh, that was very interesting. And now we have um, Hamish. Please uh, tell us about your story of success. We're, of course, very interested. 
Um, you just finished your lodge last week. Um, yeah, so fresh after um, all the experience. And uh, yeah, we'd love to hear uh, the do's and the don'ts. And uh, yeah, maybe quickly introduce yourself uh, and your project. So everybody knows for sure. <clears throat> cool. Um, yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so I am Hamish. I am one of the three co-founders of OpenChat, which is a chat application running on the internet computer. Um, if you don't use it already, have a go. It's at, you can just find it at oc.app, nice and simple URL. Um, so as a few people have mentioned already, we did an SNS decentralization sale last week. And um, yeah, we, we hit our target of 1 million ICP, which um, we were very happy with. We thought it might have taken, um, you know, two weeks and we may not have raised the maximum, but to have raised our max target in about six hours was, yeah, was good. But um, yeah, we haven't been able to party too hard because there's still, we now need to fulfill the expectation that the community has put upon us. So um, yeah, we, we're still you know this is the beginning this that we haven't done the sale and now it's over we've done the sale and now the next part of open chats journey begins um so in the in the run-up to um launching this decentralization sale we were actually in contact with Bjorn quite a lot he helped us with um setting up the configuration around um percentages to go to the community fund to protect us against um like 50 50 percent attacks because if someone had bought up all of the tokens available in the sale which is unlikely but you know we'd like to protect the service in case that had happened we wanted the voting power of the developers added to the sorry the voting power of the developers the seed funders and the community fund to exceed 50 percent this way even if someone bought up all of the tokens available in the sale they still wouldn't be able to take over the service so that you know that's a good thing and that's one of the nice properties about the community fund the community fund by having a significant chunk of the voting power it means that no one can take over 50 percent of the voting power through the sale, but it also means that the service can be decentralized because we, you know, the insiders, the developers and Definity combined, I think we have about 40% of the voting power. The community fund then has about 25 or so, and then the sale participants have the remaining like 40, like, uh, uh, 35 i think I, I can't quite remember what, what numbers i just said um but by doing it like this it's quite nice that no single segment has a majority of the power so no one can push a vote through without the agreement of the community um all of the funds that were raised during the sale they are now immediately under control of the dow so um in the in previous ICOs, like if you're launching something on maybe Ethereum, um, normally how it would work is that participants taking part in the ICO would transfer Ethereum or whatever crypto to a, an address, but that address would actually be like a, a personal address of the team launching the service. And so that team could just run off Whereas in our case, all of the ICP raised immediately goes into the treasury, which is controlled by the DAO. So we wouldn't be able to rug pull, even if we wanted to, and we don't want to, we're here for the long run. Um, yeah, also the neurons that we, the dev team received after the sale, they actually vest over four years, which I think is a nice, we chose this, but I think that's a nice feature because it gives confidence to the people who are investing in open chat that we are, we are here for the long, the long run, you know, the dev team is here for the long run. 
Um, I'm trying to think what else to cover that hasn't been covered by some of the previous talkers. Um, maybe if there's any questions, if people want to put in the chat, I'd be happy to answer any about open chat or the sale in general, or if Stephanie, you've got any questions or anyone has. Um, I'm actually, I know that Dustin has a question. So Dustin, why don't you uh, gradually get us to the Q&A session and kind of be, um, yeah, well, maybe start with a question for open chat and then we'll move forward with questions for other speakers. Thank you yeah, so much, Hamish, sure. for the quick introduction. Sure. Yes, thanks, Hamish. This, um, it's always super interesting to see real life examples of all the theoretical talk that we, that we do here. Um, my question is, uh, of course, coming from my area that I just talked about, um, and I was wondering, what are the like the utilities of the um, open chat token? Like, what what's the benefit of um, for the user to actually purchase this token aside from investing and hoping that the, it will rise in value in general? Yeah. So, um, roughly one month ago, we introduced the concept of diamond membership. And um, so open chat is free if you're a basic user, which it, it needs to be free. You know, we're trying to compete with WhatsApp and Telegram and so on. And so we want to be able to entice as many people to try it out. So it, it had to be free. So that was one thing we really wanted to go to stick with. But equally, we need to cover our own running costs. So we needed some way of making some income. So what we've opted to do is introduce diamond membership and this is um users can pay on a subscription basis you can pay for one month three months or one year um and if you pay to become a diamond member you get a load of additional features um and currently users have to pay in icp but this will change imminently so that users would pay for premium features they would pay for diamond membership using the chat tokens and the chat tokens that we receive as payment for these diamond membership upgrades would be burned. Some portion would be burned, probably 50%. So everyone who's paying for diamond membership, those payments are received by the treasury, the, the DAO controlled treasury, and it would just burn 50% of them immediately. And the other 50% would be can, uh, just held you know, for future use. And um, this is just the first revenue stream that Open Chat has. But in the future, there could there is going to be loads more. Like for example, private communities like a like a Slack workspace. You could pay on a per per member per month basis. Um, there will be lots of add-ons that you could put into your community or your group. Um, so all of these things would be paid for using chat tokens. So that kind of drives the demand. Thanks a lot. Oh, I love the idea cool. of um, of like uh, incentivizing people to use the the chat token um, to buy the diamond membership by burning half of the ones that they basically pay, because then yeah. um, you have a deflationary mechanism and this will ultimately drive up the price. It's uh, it's very cool. I see we have some questions right. in the webinar. I'll uh, let you moderate those, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Dustin. So yes, um, I'm glad we got some questions in the chat. So we have a question from Michael, um, also for Hamish. So could you um, tell us your steps um, uh, in preparation to the SNS lounge? Uh, what, uh, what do you remember? What uh, was maybe difficult, what was easy? Uh, what would you pass on to future projects? What to um, keep in mind? Yeah, well, um... Most of the work was done by Definity, really. Um, the the SNS functionality was all built by Definity. The Open Chat team just came along and basically said, "Launch," and we decided upon our configuration, which you know took a while for us to work out exactly how we wanted to do it. And um, you know, we did marketing and stuff for it on our side, but realistically. 95% of the work was done by Definity. And so for future services doing an SNS launch, the Definity have now done that work. So it should be very easy for services who 
are ready to do a decentralization sale and they, they could be much earlier on in their process than open chat was you know someone just getting started on their own could even launch an sns and do a decentralization sale you know do fundraising before they've even built anything they could just do it based on an idea and say look i'd like to raise some funds in order to build this and they could sell five percent or ten percent or whatever they want to um so now that now that definity have done that work yeah it's it should be easy for many people to do this Actually, I have a question now, maybe as a follow up uh, for Bjorn, maybe you will just quickly tell us like a new project coming to you, coming to Definity saying, I want to do this. Uh, so maybe just start in a few words, what is the journey going to look like? Yeah, so um, the I think the key, like if you look at the prep phase, um, uh, preparation phase so i think definitely like one uh one key element of that like thinking about the overall tokenomics of the system sort of like like uh, of course like first of all you need like a dap or dao uh, sorry a dap that sort of you know has a certain purpose and then once that is clearly defined derive from that the tokenomics like that's that's really important and um second i would say um you should sort of think about um uh, like like who will sort of engage with you right like what kind of participants uh users are you targeting or maybe potentially already have and then syndicate very careful with them then third i would say um once you have a clear view on how to set up the dao then do, do a lot of testing because i think it's uh, you know the launch is the launch right and and for example if you by mistake uh, uh, uh change the parameters that, that you know maybe you can change it later but i think it's it should be good it would be good to um to do like a very careful testing before so um i think these are and then of course marketing right and that's that's a key element i mean apart from syndication you have to reach out to different projects so that's that's all i would say like a, a bit a bit task all right cool. Hamish, would you add thank anything you, Bjorn. Uh, uh, i think you, i think you covered everything <laughs> great i think we have some more questions in the in the chat so we have one from james Steele. um he's asking if he will be able to buy um um from open chat using his visa card so i guess yeah yeah um what, what can we say to that I, i'd love that um but i think it wouldn't be chat specifically it would be all of the sns tokens because they all work in exactly the same way there would essentially need to be some fiat on ramp um someone build that please and um then yeah we would we would love that for sure and and it will happen just i don't know when you know like at there the you moment so we you, have can, a, you, you can go on to developer coinbase project or you can yeah like you can go on to coinbase or binance or whatever and you can buy icp with your card and yeah in the future you'd be able to buy any of the sns tokens with a card as well all right maybe somebody will get inspired to build that tool for us um yeah feel free to reach out to definity right uh, with your ideas i think this was also covered in the chat uh if you um yeah even if you're a one person team um there could be opportunities for you so um yeah feel free to get in contact um another question for hamish um how big is he, how big is your team and how much of it uh is for marketing and bd business development um well that's quite an easy answer there are three of us and we're all developers we don't have any marketing or business development but we you know we we do the marketing we do like twitter and we publish blog posts and stuff but we are primarily three developers but obviously because we're building this on our own we we have to like try and do all of the bits but yeah we you know we now that we have um essentially the open chat service has funds we could grow that team we haven't had funding so we haven't been able to grow the team but now we do so we'd love to get the community involved cool 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 um and next question also for you uh what are your future fundraising plans um now that 24 percent of uh, open chat has been dissolved how do you intend to raise additional funds yeah so in a decentralization sale we sold it was it was 25% of the chat supply not that really changed anything 
for 1 million ICP. And realistically, 1 million ICP is a massive runway given how small our team is and how, how small our team is currently and how low the running costs are for open chat. So we don't have any plans yet for raising more because that's years away unless we grow the team massively, but then we'd be changing things anyway. So we, ha we have no plans for future fundraising, but we can, we can propose to the community to sell more chat tokens if we need to. Right. I love how exciting our participants are, uh, are and how much they participate. They're asking um, questions. That's very, um, very exciting. We have one more. Um, so um, can we expect at SNS1, can we expect any projects under SNS1 DAO where people can use SNS1 tokens? Yeah, I think it's a good question. And I think it, the it's you know, it's a question for the SNS DAO, right? Sorry, that sounds a bit uh, uh, stupid, but I, I think that's really what it is because when the SNS1 is, is a DAO, it's decentralized now. So what will happen with that DAO is really up to the um, members of that DAO, right? And I think... Uh, so everybody who has a stake in it can make proposals and, um, and and vote on them. And I think there are some stuff ongoing already. I think one key, key element, I think what I saw some pattern is that the, the, uh, the, the, the more concrete the proposal is, ideally, right, very, very close or in, in code, the easier it is, right, for the DAO to decide on it. Because then it's very concrete and tangible what that change actually would mean. Cool, thank you. If you guys have follow-up questions, please um, write them in the chat as well. Uh, now we have a general one, maybe uh, for our other speakers who haven't had a question yet. Um, so does anyone know any other blockchain systems that are building similar products like the SNS? Wow, that's a very interesting one. Does anyone know anything about that? That's a good question. I mean, I think the there are other sort of DAO frameworks um, that facilitate launching um, a DAO, but I think the SNS framework itself is pretty unique in the sense of, um, I think it becomes, it comes, it's quite a complete package, including fundraising, including the community fund and a quite sophisticated governance setup. So I think in that sense, I think it's, it's uh, I'm not aware of another sort of framework that does all the same, ticks all the same boxes. Thank you, Bjorn. Um, I'm just going to take this chance for a bit of marketing. Um, I think, Dustin, uh, we should tell the community about the tool that uh, we're building at Quantum Economics um, that could work very well with the SNS. What do you think? Should we should we uh, do a small preview, which could um, help uh, new projects to really get into tokenomics? I mean, uh, thanks for uh, the pitch here. Um, I mean, it's there's no preview like this ready yet, but we are um, at Quantum Economics, of course, also um, working on a tool, which um, is kind of a next uh, generation of what also Bjorn has shown you before, uh, to have like um, a free to use online tool for you to get a first feeling of, uh, uh, of your tokenomics design and uh, to play around with your parameters, have different uh, uh, factors, parameters that you can adjust and get a feeling for these influences on your uh, on your tokenomics and this of course in the first version will be a, a basic version and it will evolve and include of course all the um, agent-based modeling that we've been working uh, um, thoroughly on and you will have a really a nice tool available to work on um, on a first let's say design of your tokenomics um, on your own actually already. Cool. Thanks, Dustin. Um, I hope we can get our community excited about this because um, I think that will um, really help projects that um, do not really know how to approach tokenomics yet to really get into, into it. Um, and uh, so I'm glad we also have this workshop, right, to kind of um, uh, demystify the whole concept. This is, um, this is really cool, I think. Um, there's a question from Tim. Um, is there a plan for an open chat app, iOS or Android? Um, yeah, this is probably the most requested feature we've had 
since we first started open chat and yeah we we do want to do this but the thing is in order to have an app on the apple app store you'd need to have a contract with apple and how could open chat sign a contract with apple in its current form it it can't but um it's very likely that we're going to have to launch an open chat foundation and the open chat foundation could then sign a contract with apple and the open chat foundation would own the app you know so that the app itself wouldn't be decentralized but then all of the underlying data or you know all of your messages and stuff would still live on the decentralized open chat system but it's just the trade-off of if if you want to have an app then you're dealing with apple or google which means you have to be in the centralized world and so it, you choose if you want to do the have the app or if you want to stay fully decentralized and so it's likely we will have an app in the future just not, not yet thank you um anyone else has any questions i think oh there you go quite a one more uh we can release an open source app for open chat how's that uh for an idea do you mean um you like the community can make uh, i'm not quite sure you mean o open chat itself all of the source code is open source and um anyone can contribute um okay if you want to make Hi. an app yeah let's get let's get in touch there you go uh already doing some networking perfect uh maybe yeah maybe we can provide our, our contact information um in the chat of all the speakers and then uh our community members can uh reach out to those that have more questions or would like to collaborate with um tim do you think that's that's doable yeah sure absolutely all right um one more question from gabriel um are there plans to create an app store, a decentralized apps app store? Wow, that would be that would be quite revolutionary. <laughs> I haven't heard anything like that. Did anybody? I guess you know, if people want it running on their phone, if they want it on like an iPhone, it would need to integrate somehow. Because the whole point of the Apple App Store is that everything is fully integrated. And so a decentralized app store, you'd need to somehow make it work with iPhones or or you don't do it with iPhones. And maybe Google, the Android phones might be a bit more lenient, maybe. I'm not quite sure. Or a whole new phone operating system. <clears throat> I guess we've got quite a bit of um, brainstorming still to do um, to come up with all these cool um, new apps. But it is and very yeah, early. Emma, I totally agree. Let's move away from the app store. Let's um, get away from Monopoly, right? I, yeah. I completely agree. But, you know, as more and more of these decentralized services launch, it might just become more and more of the norm. And then maybe Apple and Google will just start allowing apps that are decentralized onto their own app stores who knows but it's going to become we'll more and more be commonplace so maybe, I, I agree 100 percent. or maybe we'll all be communicating over the decentralized metaverse uh that we're building so who knows maybe this is what our future is going to look like anyone else has any questions i think we covered everything from the chat and we still have some time um Maybe one question for mine to Bjorn um, regarding the SNS uh, launches. Is it currently possible to uh, like just go ahead and do it yourself, or is it always in very close collaboration with um, Definity? Uh, and is there also like a waiting list? Do you have a lot of projects lined up, and uh, you have to join a waiting list if you want to start an SNS launch now, or can you just go ahead and uh, do one like this next week? Yeah, so um, uh, you can do it on your own. So like the way it works is that um, you um, you um, submit actually a proposal that has to then be, be approved by all the members of the NNS. So like the IC in a way votes on the launch. 
So even the start, even the launch of the DAO is then uh, based on a decentralized decision, which is pretty cool, I think. And uh, and it's definitely like the idea is indeed that um, uh, um, you um, you can like, every project can sort of um, um, uh, do that for itself. Of, of you know, of course, like Definity is available for I mean, potentially for advice or some you know if there's some questions and so on. But I think the idea is like. Um, uh, that this should be something that actually is 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 easy and self-explanatory, so like that many projects can can um, can can do it. In terms of the pipeline, I, I'm I I'm aware of several projects that are interested in, in doing it um, this year, even this quarter. Uh, so um, I think the um, yeah, there's definitely some. There's, there's, I think in particular, I would say, given that the open chat launch was successful, um, I think that's I, I think many projects was were watching open chat and how that rose, and I think based on that now. To amend their plans. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next uh, the next releases. Yeah, I agree. I guess uh, the success of the Open Chat launch uh, is really going to interest other projects to uh, also start and um, get going on their own token. So that's that was really cool. Uh, we have one more question. Uh... For Bjorn, what was the biggest headache when launching token on SNS? Tokenomics is one thought, one thought. Uh, actually, I didn't. Uh, okay. What was the biggest headache when launching token? Okay. Um, yeah, Hamish, I think, did you have a headache? Like when you launched OpenChat? There were many yeah. headaches in the <laughs> in the run up the few weeks before because it was just a lot of work to get done on on open chat side we had a lot of things that we just wanted to get done before the sale because also there was like the CKBTC promotion that which took up a lot of time just before the sale and so we were really busy with both um, but then the sale itself was really smooth so. Uh, we can all see that. And uh, one more time, congratulations on your big success. I think it was a fantastic sign for the whole community um, that, yeah, that there is a great future ahead of us all. Um, I there was one, a question. One more question. Covered... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go. No, so, sorry, I was just like, um, I wanted to also ask a question to uh, Lu Yao, right? Like you talked about DAOs and I enjoyed your presentation. So one one question that I had is like, um, um, what kind of like very promising uh, DAO patterns do you see, and what kind of you know, uh, what kind of DAOs uh, would you like to see more in the future? Oh yes, so uh, I th I thank you for this question. So in terms of DAO, um, I think it's very first it's very important to discuss whether it's on-chain governance or off-chain governance. Like for Bitcoin and Ethereum, I just uh, showed in the literature, uh, it's off-chain governance. So it's not quite clear what's going on because uh, to push a GitHub, uh, you need to be a core developer or a person of high engineering skills to understand how to do that. So it sounds very open, but uh, actually has a high barrier. Uh, in terms of the ancient governance, it's more uh, likely to be governed by token uh, economics and the skill to understand token economics is more um, applicable to people who, who are not even uh, like tech person. So so I, th I, th I think this feature is the like, inclusiveness is very important because that's the whole spirit of why we create DAO. So we create DAO because we want it to be um, like, like for the people by the people of the people to be as inclusive as possible so so and it seems like the direction is we want something like the on-chain governance and we want uh, token e economics which are more uh, open to the general public thank you thank you Cool, thank you very much. Um, there was one more question. Uh, what are the areas that require improvement in the new SNS system? Yes, yeah, a good one. Um, the, um, let me think about that. Um, I mean, I think one thing, 
that was um, uh, uh, was already being discussed is that uh, um, you um, sort of uh, like make the, the 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 process of submitting a proposal and and launching the DAO even simpler, right? So like that really essentially is only one action that triggers it all. So that's one one thing that is currently being under discussion. I think apart from that, um, I think we're also a bit in a phase now where uh, we want to learn about, you know, like OpenJet launched. I think um, it went quite smooth, but maybe there are additional things that uh, the users uh, are coming up with. And now, uh, based on that, we can learn and see how we, we uh, you know, we enhance the framework. So I think it's going to be interactive based on the feedback from, from the community as well. Maybe um, one thing that would be worth adding. Um, Probably the most complained, in fact, definitely the most complained about thing with the open chat sale configuration was that a single principal could was allowed to put in up to a hundred thousand ICP. And um lots of people were complaining, saying, Oh, the sale is gonna just get bought by 10 whales. Um, luckily that didn't happen. We actually had over 2,300 people take part. But um, some people have put forward a quite cool suggestion where for the first hour maybe you can only put in a small amount then the next hour a bit more the next hour a bit more I thought that seemed like a quite cool option uh, I, don't, I don't know if that would ever happen but it seemed like quite a nice way of ensuring that the small players get to take part before all the whales come in and swoop up everything or the whales just bought it and just put in 10 icp a thousand times but anyway all right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, just to cover quickly what we have in the chat. So there was a question about uh, whether it is possible to send NFTs purchased from um, NFT marketplaces, such as, for example, Yumi uh, via the open chat app uh, or uh, open chat. Sorry, I'm already the app um, universe. Uh, well, not yet, but it is um, going to be um it will be possible in the future. So this was the answer. Uh, and also NFTs, verified NFT avatars. Actually, maybe uh, tell us if you have some a bit more about this, Hamish. That sounds really cool. Um, yeah, so um, what, what we want is that users can set an NFT as their avatar and we will mark it somehow as being a verified NFT, as in so... I can't just put my avatar as someone else's NFT and claim it as my own. It wouldn't appear with the certified, maybe it has like a highlighted border or something like that. We, ha we haven't quite worked out exactly how we'd display this, but it, um, you know, we, we want people to be able to show off their new purchases. And, um, and also as the question asked, like being able to send NFTs, we, we want to be able to do that as well. We're, we're kind of waiting for an NFT standard to be decided upon by the community before we do this, because we don't want to have to integrate with Yumi and Entrepo and, and others. We'd, we'd want to integrate with the, the like agreed upon standard once, and then anyone can, any marketplace can just work. Same as we do for the ICRC one standard the ledger standard we integrate with the standard and then we can use everyone cool cool, cool. very exciting um i think we have maybe a few more minutes um anyone uh, would like to ask some last minute questions no i think looks good um Tim, so then uh, I will uh, give the word back to you um, and thank you personally very much for this opportunity to moderate this workshop. It was uh, fantastically interesting and I'm um, very much looking forward to working uh, with everyone and hearing more from everybody, um, staying in touch uh, via LinkedIn and uh, our common projects. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephanie, for moderating this. Thank you to all the speakers for being present today and thank you all for being here and listening. And uh, we hope to see you in the next weeks. Please go to divinity.org slash ICP minus labs and uh, sign up for the upcoming sessions. Looking forward to see you next week. Have a good evening, everybody.